Hi there. Welcome to the Watchmakers Apprentice podcast. My name is Garen Fraze, and I'm a professional watchmaker. And this is the very first episode of my podcast. Uh, we're going to call it The Watchmaker's Apprentice because there's always more to learn about watchmaking. So I will always be an apprentice. Um, I am really excited to start this, uh, this new venture. I've never made a podcast before. So th- this is all very new to me. I'm, I'm getting started. I, I, I tried to record this episode earlier. But uh, the program I was using to record it crashed and I lost an hour worth of footage that I had recorded. So uh, this is take two. I'm just recording the video and then I'll put it in iMovie and edit it separately. But uh, yeah, it's, um, it's a learning process. So, so please be patient with me uh, while, I, while I figure this all out. If you found this podcast through my Instagram, that's awesome. I want to thank you all for the recent support. Uh, I started making content about my work on Instagram in August and since it's now December and and I've gained 10,000 followers and then I think I'm at 11,000 now so that's just that's insane to me I didn't think that uh, me sharing my passion for watchmaking and uh, making cute relaxing videos uh, of, of me you know fixing watches would would ever have the the reach that it does now and so I'm, I'm really excited and grateful for the uh, for the community that I've been able to build and I'm excited to expand that community here on YouTube uh, and well you know wherever else you're listening to this podcast a couple weeks ago I was trying to figure out how I would expand to YouTube and I've been kind of thinking about doing a podcast for a little while thinking about doing more scripted video content for a while um, I was initially going to make like video essays and 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 watchmaking like breakdowns and stuff like that but uh i i've realized that i don't really have that amount of free time um i'm pretty busy as a watchmaker as it is and you know making the instagram videos takes up a a good bit of time so there's there's not as much time for for scripting and editing as i would like but uh, i think the podcast format is a little bit more manageable because i can kind of do more stream of consciousness just talking to you guys answering questions and uh it it also opens up the the opportunity to have guests on that i can interview uh different members of the watchmaking industry and that's very exciting to me uh the the networking aspect of it so yeah i think for now at least we're gonna we're gonna stick to the podcast format but if there's any other types of youtube content you guys are interested in seeing from me let me know and i i you know i'll think about expanding if and when I have the time for it. But uh, like I said, this is this is what feels manageable to me right now. I also would like to do a Patreon where I can do kind of a bonus episode where I'm talking more in depth about the specific work that I'm doing at Haltums um, for my job. You know what what I'm working on this week, uh, whether it be, you know, overhauling movements or I've got an interesting watch in the shop that I want to highlight, you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, If you'd like to help support that, stay tuned. There will be more ways to do that. But for now, keep watching the Instagram. Thanks for all the comments. Thanks for all the likes and the the DMs. I try to answer as many as I can and, and, you know, maintain that engagement with my community. And, yeah, I really appreciate all the support. So with that... Let's get into the uh, the meat and potatoes of this episode, shall we? Uh, so a couple weeks ago, as I was starting to plan for this podcast, I, uh, I put out a poll on my Instagram stories, um, just trying to, to gauge like what topics you guys are interested in hearing and, and maybe even get some specific questions. And I got a lot of questions. Um, I'd like to get to as many of those as I can today. Some of them I'll save for for episode two or maybe three. Um, but but for now, I, I really want to prioritize the uh, the main question that I got. I got some variation of how did you become a watchmaker? How did you start? What's your watchmaking journey? I got some variation of that question probably like 
60 to 70 percent of the time so I, I figured that'll that'll take up most of this first episode if not all um, but as far as how did I become a watchmaker uh, my journey starts as many watch enthusiasts collectors and watchmakers journeys do I was gifted a watch by a family member my grandfather collects American pocket watches you know Elgin Waltham railroad type type pocket watches and I, growing up, I loved looking at his collection. Um, he had a couple of B.W. Raymonds that I really liked that I just thought were beautiful. The uh, Now I know all the terminology for it, but the, the demasking on the bridges is just such a beautiful uh, uh, decoration. And I just loved watching the ratchet wheel turn as you, as you wound up the crown. Um, I, I loved watching the balance wheel start to oscillate back and forth. I loved peeking under the balance wheel and seeing the seeing the pallet fork and escape wheel interact. Um, it's great. I, I, I just I fell in love with watchmaking and horology from an early age. So much so that my grandfather gave me a pocket watch long before I was ready to properly care for one. I was probably like 11 or 12 when he gave me an old Waltham and uh, I took that thing with me everywhere. Yeah, I took it to, to school. I took it on the playground. I was sh always showing my friends and, and taking the case back off and watching it uh, wind up. And, you know, unbeknownst to me, it was collecting dust and dirt. And, and really, it was not good for that watch. But, uh, you know, I, I loved it. And eventually, it got enough dirt and dust in it that it, uh, it stopped running. There was, there was no longer enough power on the mainspring to overcome all the friction that uh, was impeding it. So, um, young and naive, I thought I could fix it. I was like, well, you know, I'm good at taking things apart. I'm good at fixing stuff. I've, I've always been pretty, you know, mechanically minded. So I was like, all right, I'll take this thing apart and fix it myself. Uh, I was probably like 14 or 15 at the time. And uh, the second screw that I took out was the um I, I did like no research i did no reading no proper preparation because i was you know i was 14 i didn't know what i was doing but uh the second screw that i tried to remove was the crown wheel screw and for the uninitiated crown wheel screws are generally reverse threaded that means instead of righty tidy lefty loosey it's actually lefty tidy righty loosey so i'm turning this screw to the left thinking that it's going to loosen but actually what I'm doing is tightening that screw further and providing more and more torque while the screw has nowhere to go. So eventually the screw just, the, the amount of torque that I'm providing with the screwdriver overcame the uh, amount of torque that the screw head could resist and it just snapped off. And uh, I was obviously devastated because I, I was like, what happened? How do I fix it? What's going on? And um, yeah, it was, it's a little scary, uh, and, and, and I felt terrible, so um, I immediately put back what I had already taken off, which was the ratchet wheel, um, and I gathered all the, all the parts that I had broken, and we took it to a watchmaker who, who took a look at it and said, I, I can't remember if it was like three to five hundred dollars or something. It was, it was somewhere in a range that, as a 14-year-old, was unfathomable to me. I, I couldn't imagine spending that much money to fix a watch. But that also lit up an idea in my in my brain that that said, hey, there's value in fixing these watches and, and servicing watches and repairing watches. Uh, clearly, because this guy charged I don't three or three to five somewhere in the in the let's just say four hundred. Um, I can't remember exactly, but it was somewhere around that range. If this guy's charging four hundred dollars to fix my old pocket watch, what is like like what is he making? Is is he doing all right? Is this like a potential career path for me? And so that's when I started um, looking into watchmaking more seriously as a potential career path. And it was right about the same time that I started high school that I decided, hey, I I kind of want to pursue this. I want to I want to do it. And so uh, I started looking into formal education after school, you know, opportunities post high school to, to become a watchmaker. 
and there's a lot of opportunities in the states that are tied to specific brands so like for example rolex has a school richemont which is a conglomerate of luxury swiss watch brands also has a school um and and i believe swatch has a school here in the in the united states uh, but all of those programs are sponsored by the brand so tuition is free and you just have to pay for housing and then there's other programs uh like i eventually ended up attending paris junior college which is a, a, a junior college here in the state of texas that has a watchmaking program um but i'll, I'll get into that later uh as as i started to move through high school uh, I wanted to dip my toes in the water, so I, I visited the local luxury watch dealer, which happened to be Haltom's Jewelers. That was the closest one to uh, where I went to high school. So I, I spoke to the sales team about just about watches and, and you know how I'm interested in becoming a watchmaker and interested in learning more about the industry. And one of the sales members gave me the uh, email of the general manager and told me to email her and ask about an internship. And uh, next thing I knew that the summer after my, I guess it was my sophomore year, I, I was up in Fort Worth, Texas, you know, changing batteries and sizing bracelets. And that was my, my summer internship. That was my, my summer job that year. And uh, it was awesome, I loved it. Uh, I learned a lot about the the luxury watch industry from the sales side and determined I don't want to do sales. I definitely want to do the watchmaking part because, um, you know, just, just replacing batteries and sizing bracelets, um, kind of confirmed for me that working with my hands and, and getting a more intimate understanding of these watches was, uh, was rewarding and, and something that I wanted to continue to pursue. So, so that kind of confirmed for me that I was on the right path. And so when I went back to school that year, I guess that, that would have been in between my freshman and sophomore year, because it was when I went back to school that year as a sophomore that I determined that I wanted to graduate early so I could pursue watchmaking as soon as possible. And so that's what I did. I, I took some extra classes over the next summer while I was also back at Haltom's doing, uh, doing another summer internship. And it was during that internship that Haltom's kind of gave me a little bit more responsibility. And I was no longer just in charge of, well, I was never in charge of uh, replacing batteries and all that, but I was no longer just responsible for batteries and, and bracelet sizings. And now I was also in charge of creating a YouTube channel, creating content for that channel, managing that channel. And by the way, don't go looking for that channel it's gone. Well, the channel's there, but all the all the videos are gone. Um, I was I was 16, 17 when we started that channel, and uh, uh, both I and the Haltoms management have decided that uh, we don't we don't necessarily want those uh, videos representing the brand and the brands that we carry. Also, you know, a lot of the content featured brands that we no longer carry. But while I was while I was creating those videos, uh, I. I gained a lot of skills and, and understanding and knowledge about how uh, at least the YouTube algorithm worked and, and that kind of uh, plays into other social media platforms. Uh, now now I have, you know, I've found some success on Instagram and I do owe quite a bit of that success to the experiences and, and knowledge that I gained through the, through the internship with Haltoms. Um, I think our, the best video that we made for the Haltoms channel ended up getting like 50,000 views or something before before we took it down, which is pretty good. So uh, proud of that work, but it's been archived. So don't go looking for it. Um, but as I went back to school and finished my, my junior slash senior combined year, uh, I started to apply to different uh, watchmaking programs. And I realized that most of the programs had an age requirement. And when I graduated, I was gonna be 17 and most of the age requirements were either 18 or 21. So I could have applied and I still might have gotten in uh, despite the, the age, but I didn't really understand that at the time. So I, I only applied to the programs that were tied to colleges because they didn't have an age requirement. You just had to be a student of the, of the college, of the institution. And so for me, that was the, th the three options that I, I was really aware of was 
Paris Junior College in Texas, the school at OSU, which has, has since been uh, shut down. And then- Hey guys, this is Editor Garen. I made a, uh, a mistake while I was talking about the school up in Seattle. It is the Watch Technology Institute at North Seattle College. I called it something differently, but that's all. Thank you. All the way up in Seattle. I didn't want to go to Seattle. Texas was in-state and the tuition was, was much, much more affordable. So I ended up applying to and attending the Texas Institute of Jewelry Technology Horology Program under the, uh, under the instruction of Stan McMahon. Stan started uh, about one or two semesters before I got there. And since he's joined the program, it has, has truly um, uh, grown far beyond what, what it was even when I started. Uh, it's grown well beyond what it was when he started and it continues to grow with every year that, that he is there. Uh, Stan's a gym. I, I, I feel very lucky to have been uh, a member of, of one of the very first groups that, that received instruction from him at Paris. And uh, I am looking forward to an upcoming episode of this podcast featuring him. So that's something to look forward to. And I got a lot of questions in this uh, in the Q&A on Instagram about education and all that and Stan and I will focus more on education and everything once uh, once he's here and we can line up a, a date that works for both of us to uh, to record that podcast episode so yeah I, I attended Paris straight out of high school I was still 17 at the time I did the summer semester as well so I, I got no break and I just went straight through four semesters it took a little over a year and a half and I graduated in December of 19 with my applied or with my associates of applied sciences with honors, don't forget that part. And uh, I, I maintained the relationship with Haltums. Uh, I was continuing to make YouTube content for them, driving back and forth between Paris and, and Fort Worth uh, to, to record and, and edit in my dorm room. And once I, once I graduated from PJC, Haltums was looking to hire a, a watchmaker specifically to service Rolex, because uh, Haltums is a Rolex AD and uh, a, that was about the same time that Rolex was starting to encourage their ADs to have an in-house watchmaker. And so it all just kind of worked perfectly and, and all the puzzle pieces fell into place together. I, while, I, while I was still in my, I think it was my fourth semester, my final semester at PJC, uh, me and three other of the soon to be graduates went up to Rolex's facility in Dallas and Basically, we're given a mini training on a, on a Rolex 3035. And unbeknownst to me, that was my bench test at the time. And apparently I passed because I was approved for uh, Rolex level 40 training in February of 2020. So if, if you don't know, Rolex and, and other, pretty much all brands have different tiers to their, uh, their training and authorization levels. Level 40 for Rolex is, is kind of one step above the entry tier as a watchmaker. Uh, level 30 gets you permission and parts for uh, oyster cases. So so the difference between the oyster cases that you find on like a Datejust or an Oyster Professional and the professional models, so Oyster Professional, Oyster Perpetual, the difference between Datejusts and OPs and the, the Submariners and other professional models like GMTs is um, the date just has a, a rounded case shape and that is a much easier refinishing job. Not to say that it is easy because there's no such thing as an easy polish, truly. But uh, it's, it's a little bit easier to refinish a date just and maintain the correct geometry than it is to refinish a Submariner or a GMT, uh, just the professional cases with flat sides. Uh, so, so level 30 training gets you authorization on, you know, curved sides, oyster cases, and then level 40 additionally allows you to work on professional models. And so right out of school, I was lucky enough to go to, to Rolex's uh, facility in Lidditz, Pennsylvania and get level 40 training. And that, uh, that taught me some more techniques in, in lapping and how Rolex uh, uh, approaches refinishing professional models in the after sales sector. And uh, it was a pretty fast track. I, I graduated in December, started full time at Haltums in January, 
the first couple months of my time at Haltoms was spent uh, uh, building out the workshop, ordering the tools. I, I had a hand in designing the layout of the workshop and, and figuring out what was going to be best for, uh, for my workflow and all that stuff. And then February 2020, I got the level 40 training. And then March 2020, everything shut down, as, as I'm sure you remember. Um, so, so I was just kind of sitting at home for two months, waiting to use the tools and the training that I had received. I, I had basically just gotten the workshop set up, just taken in my first couple watches and gotten the estimates out, and then everything got shut down. And so I twiddled my thumbs, as, as we all did. And then once the shop reopened, I, I never looked back. I serviced you know, date justs and submariners and GMTs for a couple years and then was, uh, was invited to Rolex's facility in Dallas right up the road for level 50 training, which would allow me to, to get authorization and parts for Daytonas. So the Daytona is a chronograph. And for those who don't know, chronographs are watches that have a timekeeping function and additionally have a stopwatch function that can be used without impeding the timekeeping function of the watch. So there's a lot more moving parts. It's a much more complicated watch. So uh, there's additional training that's needed from Rolex before they'll authorize you to use parts. And I got to I got to be honest, up until the level 50 training, I had a lot of imposter syndrome at Haltoms because it's it's just me. I'm the only watchmaker in the company. I have, you know, I have Stan as a resource. He's he's a mentor that I could always reach out to. And then uh, Rolex uh, provides you with a field service manager, basically a, a more experienced watchmaker who uh, you can always reach out to and, and ask for help if you encounter a problem, if you're in need of spare parts and you don't have them yet, uh, and there's some type of delay, they can help you out. Um, so, so I had that resource as well. But other than those two resources, I was kind of just on my own. You know, I was, I was in the deep end with, uh, with no life jacket pretty much. And so I was doing everything I could to stay afloat. And I had a lot of imposter syndrome because I, I didn't let any watches leave the shop that weren't within Rolex tolerance, but it, the, there's still just, you know, being fresh out of school and not being able to get that confirmation from a more experienced watchmaker every time that, yeah, this is good. This is acceptable work and is ready to return to the customer's wrist. Uh, it's, it's scary. It's and I, I certainly made my mistakes, and you know we all do. It's part of the learning process as a watchmaker making mistakes. But uh, I definitely had a lot of imposter syndrome until level fifty training, where I was by far the youngest watchmaker in attendance, and I was keeping up with these much more experienced watchmakers and even exceeding them in some cases. I'm not I'm not trying to you know brag or or put them down because they're each each of those gentlemen that was in the training with me were great and I have much respect for them. But uh, being in that environment with those other watchmakers and you know having having their approval as well as my trainer's approval and and you know being able to talk with them and you know these these other colleagues that I respected were showing that same level of respect to me. That was a lot of uh, yeah that that confirmation and that validation went a long way to uh, to minimize my my imposter syndrome so very grateful for that experience not only because I get to work on cooler watches now but because it was a uh, it was it was a good growth experience for me to uh, to be like okay hey you're you're doing all right you're in you're in there you know you're you, you, you know what you're doing so yeah that was great that was um, I believe that was 2022 in November of 2022 so it's been about a year now and I've serviced maybe five Daytonas and truly I, I love it. It's my favorite watch to work on. Every time a Daytona comes through the shop, I'm like, yes, let's go. But uh, yeah, that's uh, the rest is history. I, I guess um, the only next part of my journey that I, that I can really share with you guys is that I, uh, I started focusing on the content creation on Instagram, started making more videos that, uh, that, you, you may have seen, I hope you have. And if you haven't, go check out my Instagram. Uh, I've, I'll link it in the description below, but there's, there's lots, of, uh, lots of cool stuff, I think, um, on there. Whether it's, you know, uh, repairing, uh, replacing damaged balance staffs, 
fixing hair springs, uh, fixing main plates, polishing. I, I, I'm pretty detailed about all the, all the work that goes on at Haltoms and I like to share, I like to foster an, uh, an educational and engaging environment and the community that is, is the community that I've built around my content has, has been great. Uh, you guys are awesome. So yeah, that's, I've been doing that since August, like I said, and the, the growth has been really astonishing. I had no idea that it would get to this point this fast. And yeah, I, I truly, all I can do is thank you guys and thank the Instagram gods, the, the Instagram algorithm for, uh, pushing my content out to, to all you lovely people. And yeah, if you, if you came from YouTube, if the YouTube algorithm brought you here, uh, great. Welcome. Go check out my Instagram. So yeah, there you go. That's uh, that's my story. That's my journey to this point, and uh, I, I'm I'm really excited to continue sharing. I've got some really interesting content coming up that is not Rolex related. So I'm gonna start branching out a little bit and and exploring more of my true passions within the watchmaking field. Not to say that I'm not passionate about Rolex. It's a wonderful brand, and the the product is is a truly a pleasure to work on. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to expand and, and do some more vintage stuff. I've got a workbench here with far fewer tools than I need to really service vintage watches, but uh, I'm working on it. It's a process. But yeah, it's a work in progress. I'm, I'm excited to keep making content. And as long as you guys keep engaging with it and you seem to be enjoying it. So as long as you do, I'll keep making more. And uh, like I said, this uh, this podcast is a learning experience. It's a, you know It's an opportunity for growth. And I'm excited to uh, embark on this journey alongside you all. So thanks for watching. Thanks for tuning in and be sure to subscribe, follow on Instagram, all that stuff. You guys know that, you know, the deal you're, it's a digital age. I don't have to ask for this stuff anymore. You get it. Um, how do I end this? I don't know. How do you end a podcast? Um, stay tuned. Keep on ticking in the free world. No, I can't steal Nardwar's bit. What do I do? All right, I'm just going to end it there. Thank you guys for watching. I really appreciate it, and uh, I'll see you next time. Guys, it's hard to talk to nobody. Do you know that? Did you? This is tough. I have a lot more respect for podcasters now. This is this is not fun. I forgot what I was even saying. And that's like the third time this has happened. I'm not great with words, but geez. <laughs>